God uses Satan. He has a reason for his existence. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter number 1 that he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Known unto God are all of his works. We know in the book of Revelation chapter number 20 the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. That's what the Bible says. That's his future. But you've got to remember something. Satan He's not necessarily an angel. He can appear as an angel of light, but according to the scripture, he's the anointed cherub that covereth because it talks about him being cast out of heaven. He's a cherubim. So originally there were five of them and one of them fell, this anointed cherub, and that leaves four. And when the cherubim show up in the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel and in the book of Revelation, they show up as four creatures, especially in the book of Revelation. And these cherubim represent something on this earth. Now we don't get off in all that, but they are... But Satan is a cherubim. He's not necessarily an angel. And this pretty well locates him so we can understand what kind of a being he is. He's an angelic being used in the generic term of something from the heavens. In the generic sense that if, he's, if they're from the heavens, they are an angelic being. Okay. But as far as being an angel, no, he's not. He's a cherubim. But he's a brilliant cherubim. And there was a reason for his fall. And there's a reason for God using him. And there's a reason for Satan is his relationship with you. God uses Satan. Satan uses man. Even though Satan tries to destroy you when he has thrown everything he has against you, the glory of God is going to shine through. What does it mean, glory of God? What is the glory of God as it relates to a human being? What do you mean when we say glory of God? The glory of God, what's that? Is it a shining light? Is it, the, uh, is, it, is, is it this great beauty that comes forth from God? These are all natural to him. What is the glory of God as it relates to a man? I believe it's this, that regardless of what happens to you and what you go through, makes no difference one way or the other. God in his personality and in his person and who he is, is so far above us that it pulls the love of our heart out toward him and we give ourselves to him and nothing can change that regardless of what happens to us on this earth. God gets glory and the glory comes because of the character of who he is. To really know him is to love him. If you don't love the Lord tonight, it's because the God of this world has blinded your eyes to the truth. There is much to love about God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the essence of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is not a created God. He's not a lesser God. He's not a demiurge. He's not any of that junk. He is God Almighty manifest in flesh. Therefore, he's the essence of God. But on the cross, he became the essence of sin. For the Bible said God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the what? Righteousness of God in him. So one of the purposes of God bringing Christ into this world is so that you could be made the righteousness of God in him. And all of the good deeds that you live out while you're on this earth will never match the righteousness of the Son of God and the righteousness of God. You do right, right thing, and that's, a, that's akin to righteousness. But the only righteousness that really counts is the righteousness of the Son of God. And when he came into this world, the Lord Jesus came into this world, God manifest as a man. He lived out 33 and a half or a third years on this earth and he established by his life a righteousness. The God-man, he was righteous with a righteousness that did not exist until he came. The righteousness of God is a thing that has always existed. God has always been righteous. But he proved himself as a man and that righteousness is what is given to us. He's made into us righteousness. Hallelujah. That's a wonderful thing. Because I'll tell you right now, if I was depending on my righteousness and my good works to get me to heaven, I'd fall like a lead balloon. I just wouldn't make it. Look at the book of Zechariah, chapter number 3 and verse 1. When we come to this righteousness, this is the issue. Satan despises righteousness. Zechariah 3, 1. He showed to me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Notice how Satan is always at this, he's always at this critical juncture where man comes into the presence of God. You don't need Satan, folks, to, to be a fornicator. You don't need Satan to be a drunk. There's plenty in your flesh to do that. All you got to do is turn you loose and let your flesh be your flesh. You got no problem. You can go straight to the gutter in a heartbeat. 
So what keeps you right with God is something that's way beyond you. And that's what the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it has to be. In order for you to live for God, you've got to see something better than you. There's got to be something above you, right? A, 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 no man can lift you up into the presence of God. He's got to do it himself. And this is why the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ was accepted at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says, God said unto my God, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit my right hand. Here's almighty God, that eternal, absolute, invisible spirit being that is from everlasting to everlasting, saying to his Son, God. Now, man, I'm telling you right now, get a hold of that. He never called anything God. He told the Old Testament Elohim, he said, though, he said, though you are gods, and he's making a reference to angels, fallen creatures, he calls them gods because they're Elohim, little g. You follow me on this? Little g. Elohim is a generic word that means spirit beings, and it's translated as that. But to call a man God to call him Almighty God? Would the Father call a man God? Do you think the day will ever come when God calls me God? Well, of course not. But he did his son. He called him God. So he stands to resist him. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. Here's Satan again. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Here we go. Now why did he appear to the Lord Jesus? Just like he appeared to Adam. Why did he appear to Adam? Why was, what, was the big, what was the big issue with Satan and Adam? What did Adam ever do to Satan? He didn't have to. God said, Adam, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air. He gave him the kingdom of the world. He made him king over the kingdoms of the world. God gave to Adam dominion over this earth. Why did he give it to him? Because Satan had had it and lost it. Yes, he did. This goes back to the anointed cherub that covereth. He had it and lost it. God gave it to Adam. Now one shows up, the only one that has ever, that lived from the first Adam to the last Adam, from the first man to the second man. He's the only one that ever walked this earth that was fully qualified to be the king over the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And he was, when he was here on this earth, and Satan comes up to him and he says all the kingdoms of the world and shows them to him and says, they're mine and I can give them to whomsoever I will. The Lord didn't rebuke him for that, didn't call him a liar because he did have that. Adam had handed it to him. So what's he doing? He's coming face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ and he's testing his faithfulness his trust, and his connection with God the Father because the kingdoms of this world were his, but they won't be his in to take in reality till he comes back at the second advent. And now he offers him something that is his, but he can't take possession of it. Only at the right time. Timing with God is very important. God doesn't need any place to dwell, does he? If he needed some place to dwell, that place would exist before God. He doesn't need any place to dwell. He dwells within himself. I am that I am. That's what he's told Moses. So he's an eternal, absolute spirit being. That's all we know. We can't explain any more of that. God is greater than your mind can conceive. He is bigger than you can imagine. He's above and beyond human comprehension. And all that we could ever know about God until we come into his presence is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God manifest to us in the flesh. And there was, another one, there was never one before him like him, and there will never be another since him like him. The Lord Jesus Christ is God in flesh. Blessed, beautiful, lovely Son of God. And I love him and I believe in him tonight. And he's able to do above and beyond all you ask or think. He can save your soul. He's the Savior of mankind. Take hold of Him, latch on to Him, and you're saved. Make a difference what you are. That's who He is. And He went to the cross and died a horrible, unspeakable death because He loved us. That's the Son of God. But there's war in heaven. And this war may have a lot of implications, but one for certain that we can find in the context of Revelation. Satan is cast out of heaven. Once this war is over, he's cast out and his angels are cast out. And when he's cast out, he comes down and he persecutes the woman. And the Bible says he knows he hath but a short time. So apparently he realizes that it's all coming to an end. That his time is about up. What's going on here? Why the war? Could it be that one day, folks, of all of creation, all of creation, all of it. You know, the Bible says that they're going to stand before God. Maybe one day they're going to really see what goodness is and righteousness and holiness. And they're going to look at that and they're going to say, yeah, that's better. 
the goodness of God prevailed. The grace of God prevailed. The righteousness of God prevailed. Through all of the wickedness and the deceit and the lying and the cunning and the murder and the rape and the pillaging and all of that that Satan can bring down upon mankind, grace raised us above it. Righteousness is greater than it. And all of these graces come forth from God the Father through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Michael goes into the presence of Satan and now they're going to lock horns and it's going to be war. And I'm talking war, folks. I'm talking about Satan. He's no pushover. But Michael Michael isn't either. You have an archangel coming against a cherubim, and there's found no more place for them in heaven. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. What does that mean, the accuser of the brethren? No place for them in heaven. He accused them before God day and night, night and day. He's constantly coming in a legal sense. He's coming before God, and he's accusing you. And he's saying, oh, that's your son. He's a Christian. Well, look at him. Look how he's living. And if he's got anything on you, he's going to use it against you. Satan can be called a devil because of what he does. But remember, Satan is a Hebrew name. It's pure Hebrew, Satan. And it means adversary, the one who is against you. That's the basic meaning of it. So that devil, the adversary, that deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. They've been there a thousand years and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I don't know what's going through Satan's mind tonight. I don't know if his mind is so corrupted and he's so reprobate that he can't really take hold of what's happening, what his future holds. You just take an unsaved man. He won't give any thought about where he's headed. Let me say something to you tonight. Murderers go to hell. You're a rapist, you're going to hell. You're a liar, you're going to hell. The Bible said hell was created from the devil and his angel. You're headed for hell. I know you don't want to hear that, but that's where you're going. You have no hope. Well, how can I get out of hell, preacher? How can I stay out of hell? There's only one hand, just one, that can reach down and take hold of you and save you. That's the Lord Jesus. I believe the time is coming, and I believe we're there right now, where they're going to be communicating with beings from above. And the, they're already doing that. The federal government, piecemeal by piecemeal, they reveal certain things to people, and now they're telling people that they believe that there may very well be extraterrestrial beings. In other words, extraterrestrial simply means of another earth. Terra, Latin terra means the earth. So extraterrestrial, from another place, from somewhere above. And they're telling people now that we believe that there, there may be something going on there. They're preparing you. Everything that happens in our lifetime is in preparation for one great deceptive moment. The Bible said in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, for this cause, what cause? Because they love not the truth, but God sent them a strong delusion that they might be damned. Now this is the way God judges. You have the truth, you receive the truth, you've been blessed and you've been saved. You've got the truth, you reject the truth, that's your condemnation. And God's a fair God, he's a just God. So here in the book of Genesis chapter number 11, they're dealing with the heavens. And then don't you think it's amazing when God called Abram, what did he tell him to do in Genesis 15? He said, look up into the heavens. Remember that? All right, Abraham did. He said, now you go ahead and count them. Abraham said, oh Lord, you're messing with me. <laughs> I mean, who can count? You can't even count them today. Count the stars. He said, I can't do that, Lord. But I believe what you, he said to him, he said, your seed will be as the stars of heaven or as the sand of the seashore, referring to spiritual seed and the seed of the earth, the two separate branches that come from Abraham. But the whole point is this. God chose one man. That one man becomes the father of every last one of us tonight that believes. If it hadn't been for Abraham, where do we believe? Where would we be tonight? You notice that when he changed it, when he believed that, God added the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, Hey. And it was no longer A Aram, it was Abraham. Abraham. It was no longer just father, that's what Abram is. It was high father. In other words, you're not just the father of your family and of your people around you. Now you become the father of everyone that believes. Every last soul on the face of this earth, if you ever have saving faith, your faith was laid down for you from Abraham. He believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. But what makes it even greater is this. Abraham wasn't going to church over there near the Chaldees. He didn't have any prayers over there near the Chaldees. He had no teaching priesthood over there. You know, there was none of that over there. No Bible, none of that. God spoke to him. It was kind of like when God spoke to Mary. Here's something that he'd never experienced before. He said, get thee up from thy kindred and from thy land 
and to a land that I will show thee. The only way that Abraham could receive the truth and keep the truth and live for God was to be separated from where he was. This is what he does for us today. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Let me tell you something. You don't have to do that. If you're born again, you will come out from among them. There are just certain things that come because of who you are. And if you truly know the Lord Jesus, bless his righteous name tonight, you will come out from among them because the Holy Ghost will do that for you. See, here's the thing. You're messed up. If you're a Christian, you've been flat messed up. And I'm going to tell you why. You've had the Holy Ghost bless you. You felt the power of the heavens on high. You know what it is to be born of the Spirit of God and walk in joy and have joy in your soul and walk in victory and thank God for it. And then when you turn your back on the Lord and you get out in the world, you're the most miserable creature on the face of the earth. You are. If you've ever been born of the Spirit of God, you can't just turn around and walk away from God. I just disown God. You can't disown Him. You know, the Old Testament was a type. He said, I've engraven you in the palm of my hand. I've sealed you with the Holy Ghost. That sealing keeps you and marks you. You belong to me. So why don't you just be easy on yourself? <laughs> really? I mean, what, don't you, do you like this button your head against the wall? Just be easy, be easy on yourself and start living for God. And then you'll have the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Hey, we're stubborn. Oh, we'll snub up, throw our rattler out on the floor, and kick slats out of our crib, refuse our formula. We are. We can be a big baby, be full of ourselves, and think about nothing but us. Me, me, my, my. I've been offended. I'm this. I'm blah, 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 blah. But the truth of the matter is, you know what that altar of God is. You know what it is, and you know what it is to know Him. Now, where did He get me, and where did He get you? From Babylon. Say, so where is Babylon? Walk through that door right there. <laughs> You're right smack in the middle of it. That's where He called us from. He called us out of Babylon. Now, Ur of the Chaldees is part of the greater Babylon. It's part of the greater culture of Nimrod. He called us away from Nimrod. <laughs> Which brings me to where we're headed. Because we're headed back to Nimrod. When I say we, I'm speaking in general terms to the earth. I'm not. <laughs> Thank God I'm listening for a shout. I'm listening for a shout. But the earth is headed for Nimrod. You could preach a message on the second coming of Nimrod. <laughs> and probably be pretty close with it. Because another one's going to show up just like him.